I'm delighted to be here today with Richard, uh, Emeritus Professor Richard Bosworth, of course, who many of you will know, and many of you will know, obviously, his background. I'm not going to insult your intelligence by going over that here, but I am very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say today about Mussolini and cinema, uh, because, of course, cinema came of age, as it were, just about the same time as Mussolini was coming to the very sort of apex of his power. So it is a fascinating relationship and I'm looking forward to hearing from it. As Peter said, there'll be a chance for you to ask questions afterwards and I may even get to answer a ask a question or two myself. So I'll hand over now to you, Richard. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Francine and indeed Peter and everyone who's organized this. I must say that um, the person about to speak is the most technologically, sorry, is there any problem? No, the most technologically backward person you could possibly imagine, and that's me. And the other thing is that I suppose I have a feeling that um, this lecture is a bit fraudulent because it's advertised as film and Italian fascism, but we are not going to show you lots of fascist films apart from um, the fascist anthem then and right at the end, uh, Muslim declaring war in 1940. So what I really will be doing is filling in background and the handout that I think you've all been provided with um, provides you with a long list of fascist films, which if you decide you really want to explore them, are there on the web for your exploration. And that's the reason why this lecture actually starts with a non-fascist film, indeed a desperately anti-fascist film, Bernardo Bertolucci's Novecento, 1900. First screened in Rome, 1976. Um, I was there in Rome in 1976 for the whole year. It was for an Australian quite an exciting year because an Australian of leftist sympathies. Um, I, we, in fact, flew out of Sydney just before the election when the Australian people endorsed the vi vice regal intervention that had sacked Gough Whitlam. Uh, to the alarm of all left-wing Australians. And there we were in Rome where it, uh, 1976, June 1976 was the year in which um, it looked for a while as though the Communist Party with its allies might actually win an electoral victory and in the end came very close to doing so. But Novicenta was also the film of that year. And it's a film that I think fulfills a certain purpose of um, exposing cliches about fascism, cliches that this talk will probably be designed basically to reject. Um, I imagine that a lot of you have seen 1900. If you haven't, do see it. It's a beautiful film. It only goes on for five and a half hours or whatever it is. Um, but I think the ideology in it is fairly clear. So the fascist, played by Donald Sutherland um, in, in the film, uh, and an extraordinary effort by Donald Sutherland, you can pick him as a baddie because um, he, he, he murders a small boy um, and he also has bad sex all the time. So he's only in favor of, um, of um, um, Filatio and uh, he just doesn't ever get much success out of sex. Bertolucci was trying to combine Marx and Freud in perhaps a rather simple manner. The anti-fascists by contrast, well, the main anti-fascist is a much slimmer Gerard Depardieu back there in 1976, quite a beautiful Gerard Depardieu still, who's a peasant boy called Olmo, which means elm tree. So he's both red and green, I guess. And um, he is completely heroic and has nothing but good sex, including, for example, Cunnilingus, rather than Philatio to demonstrate that he, he knows what people want really um, of, of more than one gender. Then in the middle, um, there are various liberals. Um, there's um, Bert Lancaster as the symbol of Italy before fascism. Italy of the so-called Risorgimento, with plenty of limitations. And then there's um, his, his uh, son, played by Robert De Niro in this international cast, who um, can't make up his mind about fascism, I suppose, is the best way to describe him. Right at the end of the film, and this was where we were going to show you a, a, a snatch, but we, we can't do so. The film has started in 1900. Um, to be the history of the 20th century. That, that's what um, Bertolucci basically described as the history of peasant Italy in the 20th century. It was in 1945 with the defeat of fascism and the glorious victory for 
anti-fascism, but then it suddenly switches through to 1976 and you see a train line, um, which had been in the, in the film before. Obviously, it's a line down which runs the locomotive of history, uh, as Marx, um, to use Marx's metaphor. And suddenly in that shot, a mole appears, a mole who'd appeared before actually in the movie in an earlier occasion, but the mole appears again at the end. And the, all you good Marxists will know that Marx compared revolution to a mole, which digs and digs and digs, and then eventually, poof, down comes the city. So I guess the message of Bertolucci's Marxist Freudian extremely trendy film of 1976 was that, well, you never knew, but maybe 1976, the mole was going to be out there in those elections of June 1976, actually a month or so before the film was screened, when the communists didn't quite make it. So there was an image of fascism, very bad, always murdering peasants, always raping people, um, dreadful. In fact, in the literature of the subject, there's a recent book that's come out in this country by John Foote from that distinguished British family called Blood and, um, Blood and Terror, which really in many ways reiterates that thesis that it's all bad, that um, one has a choice between fascism and anti-fascism, and that's a choice between um, bad and good, bad and good, fascism is bad, the rest is good. Now, I guess I've spent my life really wondering about whether it's quite as simple as that. And um, what, what do we know about fascism? What, do you, what, what should I be introducing you to? Well, Mussolini became prime minister in uh, October 1922 and January 1925, he became dictator. He lasted as a dictator with a hiccup in 1943 through to 1945. So two decades of dictatorship. Fascism was an ideology which I guess its main initial feature was to be anti-Marxist, but by 1925, it had decided that it was totalitarian. Um, totalitarian. Totalitarian was actually a word which had been first used by a man called Giovanni Amendola, who was an anti-fascist, but it was then taken over by the regime to um, explain what they meant. And what they meant is my text for today, I think number one and the lecture handout, they meant a, a regime where all would be for the state, um, nothing would be against the state and nothing would be outside the state. And as though in demonstration of that, that meant that um, the regime abolished all other political parties. So there could only be a fascist party from um, 1924, 1925 onwards. Um, it abolished all trade unions. So um, Italy's rather powerful socialist trade unions for a while, immediately after the First World War, were abolished, as were Catholic unions and various other ones. There was only a state union in, in what was called a corporate state. Um, the the uh, regime um, was uh, strong on censorship. So the editors of most of Italy's um, leading national papers were sacked um, in that period around 1925, around the imposition of the dictatorship and replaced by, by fascists. Um, there was a lot of propaganda. The regime was very inventive in propaganda. And um, so there was an effort to persuade Italians that um, they were Italians and they were fascists and that those two terms were identical, really. Italy, of course, had been perhaps not a terribly united country um, in the time after the Risorgimento with lots of regional and local difference and all that sort of stuff. Um, but um, the regime said it was going to, going to change all that. And according to um, theories as the regime developed further in the, 19, uh, by the 1930s, um, the regime would be one which mystically, as it were, had taken control over Italian minds and Italians by then were unable to think anyway, except in a fascist way unless they were somehow the enemies of the regime. The regime had a quite active secret police. Um, and um, if you were found speaking against the regime, um, you were likely to be punished. Um, I do have a favorite example of all this, a, a very little example, but that's I'm afraid typical of my way of doing history um, from a, a, a peasant um, out in the Northern province, an important Northern province of Alessandria who um, with his mates one evening, one early, um, early summer evening went out drinking and they drank something remarkable. I think there were four of them. They drank something like 30 liters of wine 
And by the time they were stopping early in the morning, they were not seeing Giovanezza as you were hearing, but they were seeing um, the red flag, which actually came, as you might gather, came from a different sort of ideology. By the time they got back into the village, someone was informing on them. And um, the, 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 the chief peasant involved in this, who had the, has the rather splendid name of Boccaccio, but Lorenzo Boccaccio, um, was uh, sent off for a five-year term initially um, to a, a prison um, village somewhere in the south of Italy. And that was how the punishment system is, it was what was called confino, a punishment system where you were confined in, on some island off the coast or in some godforsaken southern town. There were some problems about that, but anyway, that's, that's the regime. So a tough regime, a regime um, which um, is certainly repressive, um, which um, also, of course, um, engages by the 1930s in war, um, the, it attacks Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia was a member of the League of Nations. In October 1935, goes on to intervene heavily in the Spanish Civil War. In April 1939, it invades and seizes Albania when the splendidly named King Zogu wasn't noticing sort of thing. And then in June 1940, it enters the Second World War on the German side and proceeds to fight against Britain and France then, and then against um, the Soviet Union and the United States from those countries also joined the um, alliance against Nazism in 1941. The result of all of that is that the regime, I think, by my rough count, um, has a body count during its period of office of about a million people. Um, that million is composed perhaps in a manner that needs a little bit of um, further explanation perhaps around about half of those are people who are Italians who die in those wars or in the immediate aftermath of the um, Second World War when there was still a degree of political contestation. They really, presumably also, they must also have killed some people, but I must say I haven't added them to the tally. And then 500,000 are killed um, somewhere else. And that's actually an interesting, um, interesting matter because um, Italy, of course, eventually um, goes anti-Semitic, um, participates in the Holocaust, particularly after 1943. But from 1936, 7, 8 onwards, it starts bringing in racist legislation. And in the time after 1943, about 7,000 of Italy's 50,000 or so um, Jews in their population are, are taken off to Auschwitz and such places and murdered. But that's not quite 500,000 people. Where, who are the other 500,000, other 493,000? Well, they're actually people in the Italian empire. So they're people in um, Libya, which the Italians had conquered in 1911-12, but which needed so-called pacification in the 1920s and 1930s, and then in Ethiopia. So that's a curious story because it's a story that's just a little different from what you might expect. And let me try to talk a little, little bit for a moment about what the expectation might be coming from. Because I think, I think our image of fascism tends to be an ideology that covers both the Italian dictatorship and Hitler's dictatorship. It's, and after all, the uh, Soviet Union in the Second World War, slightly strangely, given that they're really being invaded by the German Nazis. Um, declared in the great patriotic war that they were fighting against fascism, that it was an anti-fascist cause. And, and that Marxist view of fascism went right back to the start of the Italian fascist regime when the fascist movement was beating up socialists in the, in the towns of the Romagna or something or other, the Po Valley, uh, in 1921, 1922. And what that is a sign of, I suppose, is the way that the ghost of Hitler I think hangs heavily over us and really is almost impossible to escape when you're trying to discuss Italian fascism. Um, it's Hitler, the murderer of six million Jews, the, the person who perhaps um, wanted to um, impose um, Nazi fascism universally, that um, according to at least some historians, also had the ambition eventually of fighting against the United States and destroying whatever remained of liberal capitalism there. However, it seems to me that that particular line, the ghost of Hitler is something that we have to try to somehow to wriggle free from 
when we're thinking about Italian fascism and when we're thinking about Mussolini and when we're thinking about what happened with film under this regime. Um, one way out of that, and probably a common way, is actually just to make jokes about Mussolini. Um, the British have a long-standing thesis, which I think is deep in their minds, that, quote, Italians can't fight, unquote, there's something funny about them. And you can find Boris Johnson, rather typically in his not very good history of classical Rome, talking somewhere about mad old Musso. And I think that image is the sort of rival one to the idea that Mussolini is really just another Hitler. But I don't think that one works well either. So as we start talking about film, just hold in mind the fact that at least Richard Bosworth thinks that Italian society under the regime had many complications. And for every time the fascists said they were doing something, you also had to wonder whether they really were or whether it was really possible to do in a country like Italy with its divisions, with its localism, with its gender division, with its class, despite the fact that fascism thought it not clean to the abolished class and all the rest. Let me again make a little pause now because we, we were played in by Giovanezza, the fascist anthem. Now, one of the films that is on your list of things to watch before you die is a film called Benghazi, one of the la really last fascist films made in 1942 by a director called Augusto Janina. And Augusto Janino tells a story of um, determined, dogged fascist fighting in Libya, which allows them to retake the city of Benghazi. Now, if you listen to that film, when the um, fascist troops are, fascist soldiers, heroic fascist soldiers are taking Benghazi, what's playing in the background? Well, what's playing in the background is actually Italy's second national anthem of the fascist regime, the Marcia Reale, the Royal March, the March of the Royal Family, because Italy remains a monarchy through the fascist period. And um, on many formal occasions, orchestras, etc., bands had to play both Giovanizza and the Marcia Reale, eh, as an Italian might be inclined to say, and say eh all the more because the, the King of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, was famous for only being about two foot high and not intervening terribly frequently in um, major political events, although actually had quite a lot of cousins and children the way the royal families do, and they did actually appear rather more often than people normally note. But there was, of course, a much more powerful and, and, and monarchical figure in Rome um, through the fascist era, and who was that? Well, of course, it was the Pope, who had um, 20 centuries of history on his side, and the poor old fascists only had two or three on theirs, and the Savoys were also a bit of a worry. So and immediately then you start thinking of a complication and the complication is there in the history of Italian film. Because what happens? Well, I think there's sort of two or three major matters that are worth me introducing. Um, the first one is that the 1920s, so if 1922, if you like 1925 when Mussolini becomes dictator, those are years of a fascist dictatorship, which declares itself totalitarian, which does all those abolitions that I talked about, which introduces censorship, which arrests people and puts them in prison um, just for singing songs about uh, Marxists or something or other. But it's also a regime which remains acceptable in the world at large. There's quite a bit of talk about war, as there is in the and you would have seen in the, in, in the verses of Giovanezza. But Italy doesn't actually go to war with anybody through the 1920s and indeed on into the 1930s for quite a while. And wise diplomatic people, say in the Foreign Office, will note to themselves, oh, it's all that talk about war, it's just for domestic consumption, they say. American bankers are very well disposed to Italy in the 1920s, and indeed the Italian economy recovers in a slightly hiccupy fashion from the First World War through American financial aid, through American investment. And in that period, cinema is of course, as, as Francine noted, just coming into existence. And indeed it, it, it's doing so in Italy, but the story has two parts, two in a way rival parts. One part is the fascist, evil, wicked, controlling fascist part. In 1924, 
um, they set up a, a, an institution called the Instituto Luce, the, the, the light institution. And that becomes um, the organization that makes newsreels about um, events in fascist Italy and is a, 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 a complete vehicle of fascist propaganda. You, you can, they've got a wonderful archive now, it's easy enough to look up stuff. And you'll see the innumerable pictures of Mussolini off surrounded by adoring um, people who are all saying duce, 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 and he's kissing little children and doing all the sorts of things that you expect that a dictator might, might do with no sign of any opposition, whatever. Yeah. And that continues right through the regime. So we will, we will uh, end the talk with the declaration of war on the 10th of June, 1940. But what about mainstream cinema? Well, Italy has a, a very uneasy cinema industry in the 1920s. And I guess the grand generalization to make about Italian habits in cinema was that Italians do indeed go to cinema, go and more and more and in larger and larger numbers to cinema. And when they go, they have to put up with the newsreel put out by the Instituto Luce as the program starts. But after that, they watched an American film. Um, even by the late 1930s, still 75% of Italian cinema watching are American films from Hollywood. It's only later that, that um, the Italian industry really changes. So a story then of compromise, and you'll see in my text for the day that um, there are a couple of quotes. The one that's most significant is the one from Bottai, whoever, whatever number that is. Um, it doesn't really matter, but anyway, you can find it there. Bottai, who was the most intellectualist minister in fascist Italy, and he basically said, well, there's no point in trying to do propaganda in films. People won't like that. They hate being told what to do in cinema, what they want to watch. And again, this was one of the phrases of the early 1930s. They want to watch, watch white telephone movies. In a white telephone movie, a particularly gorgeous young lady will spend quite a bit of time clinging in an amorous fashion to a white telephone, talking about love and all the meaning that can come from love. Not about Mussolini, not even about Mussolini's sex life, but just about perfectly ordinary, romantic, trite love. So white telephone movies on the one hand and a newsreel on the other hand and American films. I'm going to have three hands. That's a bit of a worry um, uh, as the third category. And then things do change. They change really with the Italy, Italian invasion of Ethiopia because um, the Italians invaded Ethiopia thinking really, I think, that they were just doing what Britain and France had already done and that Britain and France would accept this and the Italians would be allowed to dart off, annex Ethiopia, and then come back and be part of a group of powers who would resist Nazism, actually. In, in, in 1934, the year before um, the invasion of Ethiopia, uh, the Germans had, um, German Nazis or Austrian Nazis had murdered um, the Chancellor of Austria, Engelbert Dolfisch, and allowed him to bleed to death on the floor of the Austrian Chancery. While that event was happening, Mrs. Dolfisch, <coughs> excuse me, and the Dolfisch kiddies were um, staying with Mrs. Mussolini in the family beach house at a place called Ricciano. And um, Mussolini didn't like that event and actually marshaled the army and took troops to the Austrian border. But the complications there all end when Italy invades Ethiopia and the Liberal Democrat world decide that this is an intolerable and un totally unacceptable way to behave. So Italy then edges into this new world. The Spanish Civil War breaks out almost immediately after Italian troops get to Addis Ababa and conquer Ethiopia in a rather superficial fashion, actually, um, and start murdering Ethiopians or continue to murder Ethiopians. Um, the um, Italy drifts into being the partner in the Axis, a, a term invented by Mussolini, not by Hitler, coming through to something called the Pact of Steel in 1939, and then eventually, after a delay, Italian intervention in the um, Second World War in June 1940. Now, in that period, Italy starts making much more overtly fascist films, and some of them are the ones that I've got listed there, which you might like to look at. A lot of them are actually, not very surprisingly, about empire. 
empire's the going thing for Italy from 1935 onwards. And really, I think you, when you view them, you might wonder to yourself just whether they are all that different from films about empire being made by Britain and France, in Britain and France, America for that matter, at the same time. This still likely to be a plot that's extraordinarily patriotic where a hero is got some troubles early on and then struggles through to some glorious um, solution to the to the problem and so that's the fascist era in film it's also given a curious family slant because Mussolini had quite a number of illegitimate children but he had five legitimate ones and his eldest son was called Vittorio which means victory he'd been born in the first world war when Mussolini switch sides and become a patriot, become a nationalist. Um, and Vittorio is, is, um, was born in 1916. So by the mid 1930s, he's able to volunteer as a pilot in Ethiopia and talks how wonderful it is um, to um, shoot down Ethio unarmed Ethiopian villages from your plane and so on and so forth. And then he comes back and becomes a film boy. He gets to editor a film magazine. He becomes friends with young significant Italian film directors, of whom the most obvious is Roberto Rossellini. And he also then goes to America. He goes to America initially thinking that, well, Hollywood must be pretty good because everyone in here is watching Hollywood movies. But he goes just as Italy is moving into its anti-Semitic phase. And by the time he's come back, He's uttering cliches about how awful the Jews are in Hollywood and how we must stand against them and blah, 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 blah. And that, I think, also further encourages this much more overt fascism in Italian cinema in those years. But again, we have a little problem. We have a little twist. Because the young men in Vittorio Mussolini's circle who are beginning to make it in 1938 and 1939 and then when the war starts, what are some of their names? Well, I've mentioned one, didn't I? Roberto Rossellini, Federico Fellini. You can just go on and on and on with these names. And why, why are these names significant? Well, everybody knows because these are the people who were so influential and significant in Italy's greatest moment in cinema history, which was immediately after the Second World War, after an alleged triumph of anti-fascism, after the death of Mussolini. Um, Rossellini is a splendid example. Let me just focus on him for a little while. And I'll start moving to end with a plug to myself. It's the only way to end things. Um, um, Rossellini. Rossellini made three movies in 1939, 41 and 42, I think, but please don't quote me, which were fascist movies, fascist movies about war, uh, fascist movies about heroism, fascist movies. And then in 1943, um, the uh, fascist um, leaders of the fascist party voted against Mussolini in a famous meeting in the rather sweetly known Room of the Parrot in the Palazzo Venezia, and Mussolini um, was persuaded to go and visit the king the next afternoon, and the king told him he was looking tired and he just happened to have a policeman outside and would he mind going with him, and Mussolini was arrested. Um, and the regime fell, but it didn't altogether fall because Mussolini was put in a, after moving around a couple of places, he was put in a mountain resort east of uh, Rome. The Germans invaded, they sent a Austrian paratrooper to uh, rescue Mussolini, he was rescued. And for the last 18 months of the war, he became that, that very curious person, a puppet dictator up in Northern Italy while the Anglo-American forces were moving up from the South and gradually liberating places like Rome, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as soon as Rome is liberated in the summer of 1943, Rossellini starts making a movie, which is one of his most famous ones it's called Rome Open City. And it's a movie uh, indeed about anti-fascist victory, about the Germans. The mor morality of the movie is not so different from Bertolucci's in 1976, because the, the, the people who are really bad in the movie are Germans, uh, are, are 
Ackermans uh, and indeed our SS, uh, an SS man is the worst of it. And what's worse for 1943, 44 in Mussolini's mind at least is he's obviously gay and therefore unacceptable for all sorts of reasons. Um, there is one policeman who cringes to him, but apart from that, the Italians are, play a minor role in the, the baddies are Germans. It's the Germans who are to blame um, for, for, for what's going on in Rome um, as, the, as, the, as the war arrives. And what about the anti-fascists? Well, what are they like? Well, um, it's even simpler than 1900, really, because um, there, there are two protagonists. One is a communist and the other one is a Catholic priest. Italy after 1945 would be governed for a long time, for decades, by a system where the Christian Democrats, the, the Catholics provided the government and the communists provided the opposition. Um, and it's all there in Roma Cita Aperta. It's all there in this Rossellini movie. Whether that's got anything to do with what was actually going on in Rome in, um, this, in, in, in the summer of 1942 or 1944, I mean, when liberation is occurring, um, is, is, is extremely doubtful. Um, Rossellini made two more, so he had a, a, a fascist trilogy and an anti-fascist trilogy. And there it was then, a complicated story, a story whereby uh, gender and class and region and locality and even different ideologies survived in this allegedly totalitarian state and society. And I promise to end with a plug for myself. In a couple of weeks time, um, the date keeps getting put back, but anyway, in a couple of weeks time, I think Cambridge University Press are going to publish my very last book. It is entitled Politics, Murder and Love in an Italian Family. And the family involved is that name, Amendola, Giovanni Amendola, you, you remember the man who invented, um, invented the word totalitarian and was then murdered by the fascists in a particularly bestial manner. He was a liberal Democrat. His son, Giorgio, eldest son, was a communist. And Giorgio um, was imprisoned um, on an island called Ponza, which is in the Tyrrhenian Sea off the coast of Naples. Um, and there he lived. And there he also, rather curiously, married a Parisian girl who he'd met in an extraordinary haze of um, leftist romanticism, um, met in Paris. Uh, there he was um, waiting around to have sex with a girl um, who I think was a dental assistant. Anyway, um, waiting around to have sex with a girl. She didn't come. He looked over at the cinema in the corner. Out of the cinema came a, a, a young woman and a much older woman, <gasps> and they fell in love. I mean, he and the young woman fell in love at that instant, and the older woman was her mum, and she stayed with them for the rest of her life. Um, but um, Germaine, was her name, Germaine Lecoq and Giorgio Mendela get married on the island of Ponza, and there, Giorgio's wonderful autobiographical accounts say, talk about fascism and repression and every now and then being dragged off to Naples for being tried for saying boo or something or other. But they also, it's um, lobsters are quite cheap because it is an island and, and, and they, they give them a house to rent by themselves and so on and so forth. And there is a rather wonderful film version of this, which is my favourite film on fascism. It's uh, there on your um, program. It's called La Villegiatura. And it basically has a plot rather like the plot of Giorgio Mendela, the Giorgio Mendela story that I just very rapidly sketched to, except the person being in prison is, um, is, is not a communist. Um, but it's a story of a man and his wife and little child living on a prison island and um, being treated as special cases by a, by a governor for his own cunning reasons and Italian will definitely tap his nose at such a moment. Um, now there's one further fascinating little detail to add to this story in, in this, um, in, in this uh, doubtless rather echoic lecture of mine. The director is a man called Marco Leto. Ever. Who's ever heard of Marco Leto, I hear you say? Well, perhaps not terribly many people. He's certainly not up to the fame of Fellini or Rossellini or somebody like that. But he does have an interesting family background. His father was perhaps third or fourth in charge of the secret police in fascist Italy. 
um, a secret police that eh, 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 sometimes did and sometimes didn't. Actually, this letter, the father um, interviewed Giorgio when he managed to be let off Ponza and was plotting to nick out of Italy and go back to Paris to the Communist Party. Um, and there, there, there is all the time then the story, I suppose, of patron client networks of the possibility of things not being quite what you say. Indeed, even one, even about the little people who are sent off to Confino, like my man, Lorenzo Boccaccio, as soon as you were sent on Confino, into Confino, you got someone in your family who could write and that, the literacy was still quite high. Or you had some family contact a local priest, um, some local military person or whatever, and you started to appeal against your sentence. And that's really, I think, how terror, and I hesitated before using the word, worked in fascist Italy. And in my new book, plug for Cambridge University Press, there is somewhere in it, a rather large photo, I hope on the early pages, but I can never know quite what CUP are doing. A rather large picture of Giorgio, who's a tall, large man, and Germaine, who's a small, beautiful young Parisian woman and the girl child, in fact, they have on Ponza sitting there beside the sea on a fascist prison island. And I suppose the, the, the comment that I'd like to leave you with visually, as it were, when you think about fascist film, is that I don't think you can find similar portraits of people, even famous people, like the son of a murdered um, um, ministerial opponent of Mussolini in uh, at Auschwitz or somewhere in the Soviet Gulag. This is something specially Italian. And the story of fascist film, again, I think is specially Italian. Okay, time for um, the, the declaration of war. And there he is, and there, and there he was. Richard, thank you so much. So, okay, I've got some questions. If everybody else would like to think of what theirs are and, and put them in the chat box, that would be terrific. Um, I suppose one of the things that, that I was thinking as you were, you were talking is that when you talk about the kind of propaganda films that there were, and I mean, you are rightly quite dismissive of those. And obviously Rossellini uh, probably sort of rather better than, than some. Was there in any way, I mean, we may have disregarded them subsequently, a kind of Laney Rafe and style equivalent in terms of Italian cinema, Italian propaganda films? Was there any defining aesthetic? I don't think there was. I don't think there was, um, Francine. Um, certainly no one in the world of newsreels that um, had her power. And I don't think there were, re I mean, I think when you look at the Istituto Luce collection, the, the, the thing that I suppose strikes me in my innocence is repetition. Um, and so whereas I guess uh, Lani Riefenstahl is really quite original in her use of uh, film images, I don't think you can really say that about fascist Italy. And I think there is that strange gap between the compulsory newsreels and actual cinema um, and it being so belated really. Uh, um, and is there any evidence that, that Mussolini himself thought much of cinema as a, as a medium for... Oh, yes. I, I mean, this was something that I was meant to mention and didn't, since it's there on the lecture handout. Mussolini loved Laurel and Hardy. Um, and he, he liked American film. Um, and particularly that sort of American film, funny American film. And um, his son, who can't be trusted, claimed after the war that um, most nights Mussolini would watch the Istituto Luce newsreel, eh, everyone had to do that, and um, the check for mistaken facts or something or other. He didn't like and um, type. He was a journal, very distinguished journalist, really. Um, but then he would watch Laurel and Hardy and allegedly go happy to bed. Just how often he was home, I'm not sure, because his sex life was complicated. But still, um, that's what... Uh, that's what the, the, the official view became after 1945. And um, that, that I think is, um, you know, it, it, it's a, he, he is there, there being quite an ordinary Italian in a curious sort of a way, but there's not, there's no pretension say, in that. 
it, it seems to be it seems to be that he shared the kind of national sentiment of of dividing your cinema watching into sort of necessary newsreels and the, and then that's right diversionary that's right yes yeah and the because uh, the the white telephone I mean white that that was that is a really interesting genre well it, it it's not unique of course to Italy because um, indeed it isn't no. Um, but that whole sort of that sense of that period where um, the consumption of, you know, kind of early consumption of white goods and luxury items and beautiful interiors and all of those things were spread through that. And that's that's always a useful diversionary tactic, particularly when, when you know, things are bad. Um, so there's yeah. no kind of link that you could make or that can be made between the kind of discipline and the display of Mussolini's, you know, the way that... that Sontag makes all this idea about Cosby Barclay mo movies and being related to kind of fascism in some way. It's it, that's much more likely to be through the sort of German connection than particularly than because of any. Yes, I think so. Um, the, um, the the Italy was of course a very poor country and um, remained a very poor country. The fascists were not very successful at managing the economy, particularly after. They um, went protectionist in the 1930s, and one of the oddities about Italy is that um, about Italy emerging after the Second World War is that it emerged with um, the state owning quite a large amount of the economy, but the state had done that to bail out um, industrialists and the wealthier sections of the Italian population who'd done quite well out of the bailout, so they hadn't been taken away from them. But if you went down to a southern Italian village, I mean, the chances of the chances of people being able to read were really, especially women, were really not very high. And of course, they did not necessarily speak Italian, they still spoke dialect. And so one of the things that I suppose cinema is doing a bit is that it's imposing a national language. But most people, most linguistic historians, I think, would say that that happens mainly in the 1950s and 1960s and not under fascism. It is, of course, again, one of the really odd contradictions in the fascist regime that he's an ultra-nationalist regime all on and on and on about the nation and fascism bound together but what's the punishment system well the punishment system is to send you to some southern village which is of course saying well you'd have to be mad to go on and live in a southern village instead of in somewhere nice like Florence or Rome or Milan or something and that contradiction is never resolved and it, it's there in the Italian armies and the second world war also so uh Thomas has got a question. Uh, do you want to unmute, and, and which is about Chine Chicha, the, the, the studio? Do you want to oh, unmute yes. and play it? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, thanks very much, Francis <laughs> and Richard. Um, yeah, I was just a bit curious if uh, between you, you could expand a bit on the famous Chine Chita um studios and I'm not quite sure when they were founded. And 1937. Ah, well, 1937, so, so, so late. So, so was, was, was the state very much involved in that? Um, yes, yes, um, state science. Yes, but I and, mean, um, sorry, you go on. Sorry. Go on. The, carry on, Richard, I was going to say, you, you no, explained you that. carry on, Francis. No, no, I was, I was actually going to talk about something a little bit earlier, but uh, but you explain about state funding and Chine Chita to start with. <laughs> well, I mean, Chine Chita, I think I, I should have mentioned it, but it, it just fits the general thesis that it's really only in the late 1930s that the regime becomes active in the way that um, cliche suggests to you that um, totalitarian dictatorships become in cinema. And it, it, it is, I mean, it's given heaps of finance and these films that um, you know, the young Rossellini and all the rest of them make are well financed and often um, have uh, massive casts and they, they, since a lot of them are filmed in Africa, there are major complications in going off and filming in Libya or um, even in Ethiopia, I think maybe some of them, um, that need a lot of financial support. So they're very expensive. I don't know whether any of them made a profit. I, I would be very doubtful by you might know better than me, Francine, about that one. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think they they would ever have returned a great deal. But obviously, they do allow that generation of filmmakers to start to make yeah you know, to experiment, and and that's going to be important later. But of course, 
it's this is the kind of second great flowering of it because there's a much earlier flowering of Italian cinema and way, way back when it's it's the huge mm -hmm. epics and uh, much you know, in the teens and kind of going into the early 20s, but mainly in, in the sort of late teens. And from those Italian films, then the Americans start to learn about. It. So it, it works that way that there's a kind of before Hollywood, you've got fantastic, lots of amazing live wild animals and just vast, vast epics, quite often using real um, archaeological sites to, <laughs> to film yes. it. Yes. And, and that's that's a tremendous moment too. And then it all goes more, then then the, the rise of Hollywood comes and, and so Italian cinema. Then they, they basically all go bankrupt in the 1920s, don't they? Mm. Um, I mean, the... the um, in, because of my various quotes for the day, there is one there from um, Corriere della Sera in 1916, basically saying that cinema is tripe. And since Corriere della Sera was the most serious Italian liberal newspaper, it's an interesting stance. The other thing all the time, of course, is that the Vatican has a line on cinema that one really shouldn't forget. They actually set up a, their own news service um, almost immediately after the fascists do, called Cuce instead of Muche. And um, so if, again, if, if we go to this southern village, it might well be that the only projector that anyone has is the local prick, and he will not be showing fascist films. He probably won't even be showing fascist newsreels. He'll be showing stuff that's been authorised by the church. Um, Pius XI, on a couple of occasions, used the word totalitarian favourably about the Vatican. But yes, of course, we're a totalitarian system. That's the way to be, what he basically said. Um, and you know, in cinema, there is certainly is an element of that because um, in terms of morals and so on, the, uh, the morals of the white telephone are a bit worrying, aren't they, for some Catholic yeah. uh, thinkers? But the, the kind of, the, the, the sort of, um, you know, brother against brother or comrade or old friend against old friend, that idea of the way that fascism worked is absolutely central to Bertolucci's later, you know, 1970s views of it, because it's all about protagonists who were close and then are divided or... or Although they are, they are split by class, I think, because okay. the liberals are landowners, the um, Marxists are peasants, and the fascists are um, petty bourgeois. Donald Sutherland is a return soldier, I think. Um, and so... That's, but that's 1970s Bertolucci style Marxism. Yeah. Not very I'm, complicated. I'm wondering if you, I mean, have you seen anything that is more recent than, than the 70s that seems to you a more nuanced view possibly of fascism of that period? And I'm struggling a bit to think. <laughs> um, I, I, mean, I, I don't know that I've seen any, I mean, I'd rather stop going to Italian films 20 years ago, Francine, but I mean, things like Una Giornata Particolare and so on. There are things that are much better, um, apart from the fact that I reckon La Villegiatura reached the summit and once that was reached, there was a, no need to go further. I mean, something like Fellini's um, Amacord is a, is a wonderful film about fascism and very ambiguous, I think, in, in the image, again, of a small town um, on the Adriatic. And, um, having a dictatorship and they're, they're being fascists, but on the other hand, there have been lots of other things going on. Yeah. Well, maybe given the current situation, there might be a whole new, who knows, <laughs> a whole new wave of it. <laughs> yes, she seems to be being careful at the moment. She seems to be very careful, seems to be very careful but you know, it, it, okay, as a historian, how long do you think it takes for somebody to be able to make a really, okay, you, you could argue that Bertolucci, it takes, 40 years maybe, or uh, maybe even longer, that kind of view before you can actually make a really satisfying film about a particular period. What do you reckon? Yeah, I mean, you would know the answer to that question so much better than I would, I think. I don't know the time. I mean, does time really matter? I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose I think Roma Cheetah Repetta is an interesting film about fascism, but you need to see the setting, and I suppose, that's probably true of all films that they both show you, if they're, if they're trying to be historical, they show you something about the past, but they're likely to show you much more about the present 
about the moment when they're being made. And obviously Novicento uh, is strongly about the 1970s um, in, in all sorts of attitudes, both to politics and to all sorts of social issues, really. Um, and I think that's always true, isn't it? That uh, I don't think you can do pure, some sort of pure objective historical film, but the historian's not objective either. I mean, we, what we write always carries elements from the time of composition as well as um, the period that we're purporting to describe. And that's why history keeps changing mm -hmm. um, because the questions change. Mm -hmm. I mean, well the like classic that. one. Yeah. The classic one in, in my generation, at least, was that um, if you picked up, I, I seem to remember being able to say that you picked up the main history of Germany in 1960 and looked for women in the index, you couldn't find an entry. And uh, you couldn't find an entry because there was no reference to yeah. women, but that wouldn't be true anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I hope. No, that's right. And actually, there's a very interesting talk about women, but there's a very interesting comparison with with the kind of neorealist films that emerged from Italy and the kind of rubble films that you get in Germany, which are, I mean, don't have anything like the distinctive aesthetic, um, and are, yeah, are, are much more sort of, I suppose, obviously ideas driven, and therefore they're actually rather less less good films. But that's a very that, that is absolutely all shot rather as Romeo and City is, you know, in the rubble of what, what went on. Um, yes, I mean, what Rossellini, of course, the third of his anti-fascist trilogy is that one called Germania and Up Zero, mm. about rubble, really. <laughs> so he's got the one called Paisar, which is about localism, really, about the difference between in the south and the north and so on, and then Germany and of zero is about what had happened to the hour. Mm. Do you think, okay, we're just about out of time, aren't we? But I, did you think that cinema is generally rather undervalued by historians? Say, is, is rather sorry, what? Undervalued by historians or, or dismissed by historians? No, I don't. I mean, I, 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 um, I don't think you can make such a such a generalization. So um, it's it's used by uh, some historians more than by others. Um, I've actually was just reading for someone who wanted me to read it, a history of Italy that he'd written and um, he, he actually keeps bringing cinema in. Cinema sort of plays in the third position as it were almost in, in his history of Italy. And so I don't see why you can't do that. And people do it sometimes and not at others, I think. Um, but what historians are going to decide, to, I mean, the, the other uh, um, thing you can, um, is, is rather obvious, the last book review that I wrote was an environmental history of fascist Italy. Um, and um, so, you know, what do you expect? Mussolini did on one occasion say, quote, I love trees, unquote. But um, the book was declared at the beginning, actually, it was dedicated to anti-fascists of past, present and future. So. It wasn't going to carry on about Mussolini as a green person in the way I guess that some of the Nazis probably were in their horrible racist version of such things. Um, but um, you know, that's that's what history does. It catches up with what people are asking about in the present. Yeah, and I mean, and, and that's, well, that's what's so fascinating about the, the way you write about it is that you absolutely always make it kind of alive and um, it's always very kind of breathing. Yeah. So, um, and, and for that, many thanks. And indeed, I see we are now just about out of time. So, um, we, we must be. Let's hope people who are not asking questions will go and watch some of the movies that are on their handout. Yeah, it's, terrific. <laughs> it's a terrific list. And this is a terrific you know, resource to, to go on. And uh, so, Richard, thank you very much for that. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Uh, Th thank, thank you, Richard, and thank you too, Francine, for chairing such a wonderful discussion. I'd also like to do a special thank you also to Tom Brown, who asked the question before, who actually suggested this idea for this event to me when we put together this series. So thank you, Tom, for being the inspiration to bring Richard and Francine together for what's been a fascinating exploration of uh, cinema and Mussolini, and a topic that I have to admit, with current politics as it is, a slightly worrying sense of history's cyclical nature coming through. Um, the next event in this series will be in, uh, on the 9th of February, where we're going to be joined by uh, Professors Catherine Cole and Caroline Warman, who are going to be discussing Catherine's creative multilingualism project.
uh, which will be exciting part again of this series looking at international themes. And then our first in-person event, in fact, linking to the idea of populism and politics, the Shakespeare Project moves on to Henry VI Part Two, and which and I have just got the fascinating figure of Jack Cade and that terrifying <laughs> nature of the politics in that play. Uh, and then I can give you a little exclusive bit of information that tomorrow the All Alumni Dinner is going to go on sale, where we have two very exciting guests of honours who will be speaking at the end of that. But like some great films, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger and say, keep an eye on your inbox to find out who they are. But thank you once again to Richard, to Francine. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and see you all again at an event soon. Thank you so much and good night.